Everyone learns in school that the Catholic Church was the big enemy of science. Well, you know who doesn't believe that anymore? Professional historians of science. Join me today on The Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization, and we'll learn the truth. Welcome to the Catholic Church Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. It comes as a surprise, doesn't it, to learn that the Catholic Church may have had a positive role in the development of science, right? Because we're all taught from birth the exact opposite. In school, in the media, in movies, scientists are always brave martyrs against the ignorant church that wants to suppress their findings. Well, you might be excused for this view if you lived a hundred years ago, because then the dominant book on the subject was written by a fellow named Andrew Dixon White. I mentioned him in our first program, because he wrote a book called A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. This became the defining volume on this subject. But it is full of nonsense. In fact, it turns out that in White's book, you actually read that the Catholic Church taught that the earth was flat. Now we saw last time there is not the tiniest stitch of evidence for that. But White, anxious to portray the church as silly and backward and ridiculous, simply repeated what other historians had said without bothering to investigate it. That was the quality of his book. Since then, White's book has been so dramatically overturned that you'd think we'd be reading something about it. We'd hear, hey, the Catholic Church, after all, played an important role in the sciences, but instead, we hear only crickets. There's no real anxiety, there's no anxiousness to get to the truth in this matter. I wonder why that is. Well, there are a lot of modern historians who, unlike uh, uh, Professor White, are still alive and who are doing work right now and who have concluded that, in fact, the Church has played at least some kind of positive role, and some scholars even go far as to, so far as to say that the church had certain ideas that were indispensable to the development of science. Well, that's the opposite of what we hear, right? But you have scholars saying this all the time. Thomas Goldstein, Toby Huff, A.C. Crombie, Edward Grant, David Lindbergh, uh, Professor Heilbronn at Berkeley, and many others. So what are they saying? And how dare they say this? Don't they know the Catholic Church is nothing but an oppressor of the geniuses of the world? Well, let's look at some of the claims that these new historians are making. And by the way, they are not all Catholic. Some are Catholic, some aren't Catholic. I've deliberately gone out of my way to consult historians of science who are non-Catholic, some of whom are even anti-Catholic, in order to show that this is for real. This isn't a bunch of Catholics writing some books to make the church look good. This is the consensus among professionals today. Now, one of the most important principles that the Catholic Church contributed to the development of science comes from a biblical verse, a biblical verse that was one of the most frequently quoted in the whole Middle Ages. And that verse is Wisdom 1121. And that verse tells us that God has ordered all things according to measure, number, and weight. Okay, so that doesn't sound explosive right off the bat, but I promise you it is. God has ordered all things according to measure, number, and weight. What did people take that to mean? They took it to mean that the universe God has created is orderly. It makes sense. It's intelligible to our minds. It's mathematical. It's ordered according to patterns measure, number, weight. There is something mathematical about the universe. St. Augustine, for example, said, God is like a great geometer. He's a great practitioner of geometry. So for anybody watching who hated geometry, hated math, well, St. Augustine is implicitly rebuking you because in fact, mathematics is, in fa is really a language that God uses 
in ordering and fashioning this universe that he's given us. So the Christian tradition, through this wisdom verse that was quoted all through the Middle Ages, dramatically amplifies an existing tradition in the West, going back to the 6th century BC and the great pre-Socratic philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras. In the 6th century BC, Pythagoras had said, you know what the universe is made of? It's not made out of air or water or earth, as some of his contemporaries had said. It's made out of numbers. That's the fundamental constituent of our universe. Not physical stuff, but numbers, math. Math is everywhere. And this Christian tradition, building on Wisdom 1121, took Pythagoras' obscure insight and in effect developed a whole civilization around it. That's pretty important. And in fact, even scientists who may not have given the matter a second thought lived in a civilization in which the orderliness of the world was taken for granted. So, for example, let's consider the gentleman who drew up for us the first periodic table of the elements, Dmitry Mendeleev. He so believed that the universe was orderly that when he began arranging the elements, and perhaps you've seen the periodic table of the elements, got all the constituent parts of our world, and they're listed according in rows, and then a series of rows creates columns, and he found that elements that were next to each other on the table possessed similar characteristics. Well, then he got to about element number 21, and there was a gap there. He couldn't find an element that should fit there. But he said, the relationships keep working if I skip number 21 and I keep going. But so convinced was he that something had to go there. So convinced was he that God couldn't have given us this universe or that we couldn't, he couldn't believe we could live in a universe where there'd be a big gap on the periodic table. There had to be something that belonged there. So he predicted, well, someday we'll discover an element that goes there. I mean, what nerve the guy has to say, of course we'll find something to fit into the gap on my chart. But sure enough, what did they find? Ten years later, the, the element scandium was discovered. Where does it go? It's atomic number 21. So this is a key feature of our civilization. And in fact, the scientific method cannot be pursued unless you believe the universe is orderly. Because what do you do in the scientific method? What's it all about? The scientific method consists of gathering data about the world around you and then studying that data, looking for patterns, trying to understand it, and then developing hypotheses about the data. Why do I think thus and so is occurring? And then devising experiments to then confirm or disconfirm my various hypotheses. Now you cannot follow those steps unless you believe the universe is orderly. Because I have to be sure, I have to have a confidence that if I run the same experiment multiple times under the same conditions, I will get the same results. Now, if I live in a disorderly universe, I have no right to expect that. Maybe, sure, maybe six times when I drop something, it will fall to the ground, but maybe the seventh time, the object will turn into Elvis. How do I know? If I don't live in an orderly universe, I have no right to expect that. And if I don't live in an orderly universe, I can't even begin to do science. I can't even begin to find patterns in the universe if I don't expect them to be there. This is essential for science. And in fact, Albert Einstein even said, we, it's, it's a miracle that the universe is orderly. We have absolutely no right to assume that. And in fact, many civilizations did not assume it. They did not assume it. Ancient Babylon, for example, the Babylonians did not assume the universe was orderly. It was completely chaotic. Did science get started among the ancient Babylonians? The question answers itself, doesn't it? So these are essential points. These are essential points that the universe is orderly and mathematical. Now that does not mean that the universe is so orderly that God can't perform miracles, that that would somehow violate the order of the universe. Of course, as Catholics, we believe in miracles. God can perform miracles. Of course we believe that. But understand what that means. You can only recognize a miracle if it takes place against a backdrop of order. If we lived in a completely chaotic universe, 
How could we recognize a miracle? Everything would be a miracle. Everything's crazy and chaotic and doesn't follow any laws. So we recognize God's miracles because He performs them within a universe of order. St. Anselm very helpfully clarified this point. He said that God has His absolute power, or potentia absoluta, for you Latinists, and His ordered power, or potentia ordinata. That is to say, sure, God has the raw power to turn that object into Elvis, but He also has His ordered power by which He he behaves according to the laws that He's built into the universe, that it would not befit the dignity of our God for Him to behave in such a whimsical way. He can't do that. He has to, in effect, behave in a way that is consistent with His promises to us. And in effect, the functioning of the universe is one of those promises. So we expect to find order in the universe, and that's why scientists go looking for it. But as I say, not all civilizations have been able to do this, have had this insight. We take this insight for granted. The universe makes sense. We can find mathematical relationships in it, but not every civilization could. And one civilization that could not is Islamic civilization. Now, there's much we can say about Islamic contributions to civilization and even the sciences. For example, in some of what we might call the applied sciences, like medicine and optics. Well, Muslims made great contributions in those areas. But in the more theoretical sciences, Islamic science, in effect, suffered what Father Stanley Yaki calls a stillbirth. It seemed like it was going somewhere, and then boom, gone. And then today, of course, Islamic uh, civilization is largely a backwater scientifically. Now, why is that? Why did Islam suffer such devastation in terms of the sciences? One reason involves this matter of the ability to view the universe as being orderly. Islamic civilization could not do that. Because if you were to say that the universe is ordered according to certain laws that must be observed, that would be an insult to Allah, who may behave as arbitrarily as He wants. What looks like a law to you may just be one of His habits that He can discontinue at any time. Well, we've got a break now, but come on back for some more myth-busting about the church and science. Welcome back to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. Before the break, we discussed some forbidden truths about the church and science. We know what we're supposed to say. We're supposed to say the church has been nothing but an obstacle to the sciences. But that's not what professional historians of science are saying. And if you recall from our first episode, I mentioned that the most depressing job on earth would be to be a professor of medieval studies trying to tell people that the Middle Ages weren't really so bad. Well, I think a good runner-up for most depressing job on earth would be to be a historian of science, trying to argue that, in fact, the church had, by and large, a positive influence on the sciences. Even your fellow scientists aren't going to believe you, much less the general public. But yet you have an enormous amount of evidence that you can amass. And book after book after book is being written today, and yet you still can't crack through to the general public. One of the reasons I ended up writing a book called How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization was that I was afraid that all these wonderful studies that professors are doing that are vindicating the church aren't getting to the general public. People are still being taught the nonsense about the church as an opponent of science. So now we've got to go and, and study this stuff so we can better defend ourselves. But let me tell you something. Today, if you were taking a course on the history of science, and some un universities have that as a separate discipline, if you were taking a course in that and you said, oh, religion and science have been nothing but enemies over the years, you would be considered to have written, in effect, a fourth grade term paper. Like No one would take that seriously anymore. So let's return to our discussion from before the break when I was saying that the key insight that allows a breakthrough in science 
in the West is the Catholic view of God as being orderly, a view that is derived principally, though by no means exclusively, through that wisdom verse, 1121, that God has ordered all things according to measure, number, and weight. And we saw that St. Augustine took that to mean that God was a great geometer, and other Christian thinkers elaborated on it as well. At the cathedral school at Chartres, for example, in France, there was a lot of elaboration on that critical wisdom verse. Now, cathedral school, first of all, what's that? Charlemagne, who was emperor, emperor of the West from about 768 to 814, had established that the various cathedrals should, should have schools set up, attached to them. And these cathedral schools, in some cases, developed into our earliest universities, although we'll discuss that in a future episode. But at the cathedral school at Chartres, those scholars seized upon Wisdom 1121 and took it to mean that if we want to understand the universe, we must understand it quantitatively. That's a fancy way of saying that if we want to understand the universe, we have to understand it through math. Well, that is actually an extraordinarily modern idea. The cathedral school at Chartres was really at its peak perhaps in the 12th century, and yet it's got this fantastically modern idea that at least at some level, the universe can and should be understood mathematically if we want to understand its workings and predict how it will behave in the future. We have to understand it through math. And they interpreted Wisdom 1121 to mean just that, that the universe is mathematical and we understand it that way. Because the cathedral school at Chartres spread this idea far and wide that the, under, that the universe is mathematical and should be understood through math, they are increasingly given credit as having helped to launch the scientific revolution centuries before it really began to take place in the 17th century. In addition to that, the scholars at Chartres took for granted that God was orderly and had built natural laws into the world, and that if we want to understand how the world works, we first use our natural reason. And only when our natural reason breaks down do we then say we are faced with a miracle, we're faced with something supernatural, and we refer this to God. But the Chartres scholars were convinced that God has given us our reason for a reason that we're not cows, we're not aardvarks, we're not ants. We have the ability to think and to draw cause and effect conclusions and relationships. Why would God give us this faculty unless we were meant to use it? And we become true human beings only when we use the unique gift that human beings alone possess, which is reason. So for example, one scholar at Chartres said, it is through reason that we are men. For if we turned our backs on the amazing, rational beauty of the universe we live in, we should indeed deserve to be driven therefrom, like a guest unappreciative of the house into which he has been received." Hmm. Another scholar at Chartres said, I take nothing away from God. He's the author of all things, evil accepted. But the nature with which he endowed his creatures accomplishes a whole scheme of operations and these too turn to His glory, because it is He who created this very nature. In other words, God created us with a rational nature. So we give Him glory when we have recourse to that rational nature. Now that is very much the opposite of what people are told, isn't it, about the Catholic Church. I think most people are under the belief that the Church teaches you that you shouldn't use your human reason, that human reason is, is in some way phony, or uh, something to be despised even. But to the contrary, here we have one of the most accomplished and important schools of the whole Middle Ages telling us that we should use our reason if we want to understand the way the universe works. Now from that, I return to the point that Chartres emphasized the mathematical nature of the universe. And in doing so, they gave birth to a central modern idea that if you want to understand physical relationships, and how the physical universe operates, you have to explain it mathematically. You have mastered the universe only when you have unlocked its mysteries through the language of mathematics. And that's why Sir Isaac Newton was so impressive to people in the 18th century when with a single equation he was able to account for all the motion in the universe. 
that was an extraordinarily elegant explanation of a seemingly complicated problem. All the different kinds of motion could be reduced to one equation. And so in the sense in which we're speaking of, he understood the universe because he was able to take disparate phenomena that are all different, different kinds of motion, but yet account for them all with one simple, elegant mathematical equation. So he is simply bringing to fruition the mission that the Cathedral School of Chartres gave to the scholars and scientists of the West. Now, another problem that was solved in large part by the Cathedral School at Chartres goes all the way back to the ancient world, all the way back to the world of ancient Greece and Rome. Because as far back as that time, people had believed that the heavenly bodies that you see out there were in fact in some way divine. They must have some kind of divine attributes, or perhaps they, they even have, in, they have souls in some way, or they were composed of imperishable matter that operated according to laws different from those of our terrestrial world here on earth. This was taken for granted for many reasons. For instance, in the ancient world it was taken for granted that a body at rest tends to stay at rest. But a body in motion can only be in motion if something is forcing it into motion. So in other words, the ancient world took for granted that the natural state of things is to be at rest. Motion needs to be accounted for. And yet they look out in the sky and they see the planets are moving, but there's no big hand pushing them. So what's making them move? They should be at rest. What's making them move? So they had to posit all kinds of theories that maybe, maybe they have souls and the souls give, impart motion to them, or they're divine and that accounts for their movement, or later it was proposed that angels might be pushing them. There were all kinds of theories to account for this. But it was taken for granted that there must be different rules governing motion in outer space and governing motion on Earth, because what's going on? Why do they keep on moving? They just couldn't figure it out. These things must be fundamentally different from the things on our Earth. Now Isaac Newton later showed that in fact the same laws of motion were at work in the heavens and on Earth. That was a breakthrough. But it wasn't something that just came out of left field. Because who really began thinking this for the first time? It was Terry of Chartres, another scholar at the Cathedral School of Chartres in the 12th century. What did Terry say? He said that, in effect, what you have in the universe in, and in outer space are things that are composed of the same kind of matter that we have here on Earth. Now, he couldn't quite account for why they orbited and why they seemed to move on their own. Uh, he hadn't anticipated Newton's uh, laws of motion. But by saying that the stuff out there is in no fundamental way any different from the stuff down here, he has paved the way for a central conclusion of modern science. Now, Thomas Goldstein is a recent historian of the history of science. What does he have to say about the Cathedral School at Chartres? He says, in a period of 15 to 20 years, around the middle of the 12th century, a handful of men were consciously striving to launch the evolution of Western science and undertook every major step that was needed to achieve that end. Goldstein even went so far as to say that someday Terry of Chartres will be viewed as one of the great founders of modern science. Now can you believe that? There's a historian writing just in this generation. And not only does he credit the church with lending an important impetus to the development of science, but he even goes all the way back to the 12th century to identify somebody nobody's ever heard of and say he may be one of the great architects of modern science. This is becoming absolutely common among historians of science. Yes, Richard Dawkins is writing his books. Daniel Dennett keeps writing his books uh, as scientific atheists. But as historians of science, you consistently get more and more favor shown toward the Catholic Church. Now the secret is, the question is, how do we get this information to the general public? And as I say, it's not going to get out there unless Catholics start telling it themselves. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, because what we've discussed today is very theoretical. The idea that the universe is orderly, and so on and on, that it's, it's built according to fixed physical laws. 
That's all very theoretical. But next time, we're going to get down to the nuts and bolts, because next time we're going to look at how many priests were scientific pioneers. It's not enough to say, oh, look at all these scientists who happen to be Catholic. Well, that could be just a coincidence. They just happen to be Catholic. But when you're talking about priests who occupy such an elevated role in the life of the church, who have taken holy orders and have that sacred vocation, if they are great practitioners of the sciences and are congratulated by the popes for doing so, then surely the Catholic Church cannot be the enemy of science. So let's look at these great scientific heroes in the Catholic Church next time when we come back once again for the Catholic Church Builder of Civilization.